Kevin Costner may be the king of the baseball movie. It just seems like every time they want to cast somebody in a baseball movie, somehow he ends up in it. Um, last week, we started talking about this concept of running the bases. More specifically, we are going to look at the four barriers that we sometimes place as we try to move from area to area in our life. Reasons that we just fail to commit because, well, we put something in the way. And last week, remember, we, we talked about the idea that sometimes we put it in the fact that it's just too hard. It's just too difficult. I can't make the commitment because, well, it's, it's hard. It's complicated. And so the reality is, is we kind of found out, that, well, it is supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it. We'd have no problem. I was talking to somebody right before the service this morning, and, and it just kind of hit me. You notice how many people they have at NFL stadiums these days? You know how many it is? Some of them, those games, 50, 60, Dallas Cowboy fan, it's over 100,000 people. You know why? Going to a football game is easy. It's not complicated. Buy a ticket, drive to the stadium, park your car, buy your $20 hot dog, and sit in your seat and yell at a crazy person. It's really easy. But this Christian life, well, it can be very hard at times. And so this morning as we round first base and we head into second base, we're going to look at a second thing that we put away, a second barrier that we put up, and then well, it's afraid of failure. We don't, we don't want to commit because we're just afraid that if we commit, well, we're going to fail. And then when we fail, everybody's going to laugh at us. Or somebody's going to find out all of our secrets. So we just kind of keep God and we keep our spiritual relationship at arm's length because if I let it get too close, if it really becomes real, then you know what? There's this chance that I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to fail. And so I want to begin this morning by talking about this obscure little baseball movie that honestly, ladies probably didn't go see because it just didn't do a lot of money at the, at the box office. Ladies didn't go see it usually because it's a baseball movie and usually ladies avoid sports movies. And then, but if you really looked at the movie, you found out that the movie was really a chick flick. Because it really wasn't about the baseball game, it was about a relationship going on behind the baseball game. So a lot of guys didn't go see it because it kind of got that review that it was kind of like a, a lady. So it didn't do a lot of box office business, but it's called For the Love of the Game. In it, Kevin Costner plays Billy Chappell. He's an aging baseball player. In fact, as it turns out, what he's pitching is his last game. Billy's had a good career, not great, probably not going to end up in the Hall of Fame. He's had a lot of injuries. As a matter of fact, at one point in the movie, he almost lost his hand due to an injury. He's been traded from team to team, even been cut a few times throughout his career. But he's endured. And now here he is in the eighth inning of the last game of his career, and it's perfect. Through seven innings, he has faced exactly 21 batters and gotten all of them out. He's been in what you call a zone. Nobody even wanted to talk to him when he was sitting on the bench for fear that they would snap him out of, of what groove he was in, and they just wanted to leave him right where he was because he's in a zone. But at the start of the eighth inning, Billy goes out to the mound he makes a huge mistake. He looks at the scoreboard. And as he looked at the scoreboard, he saw zero, 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 all the way across the board. And it dawned on him that he was pitching a perfect game. And well, just like that, Billy's afraid. Just like that, Billy loses his confidence. Just like that, Billy comes out of his zone. And just like that, he's afraid. And I, I have to wonder, what causes his fear? What causes somebody that had been standing out on those mounds all those years, all of that game, doing everything that's there, why on earth would he become afraid? Well, there's some reasons. You see, Billy, well... He paid more attention to what was left to do instead of what he had accomplished. Ponder that for a second. He only had two more innings to go. He had already faced 21 batters. 
There were only six more to go, but all of a sudden as he stared at that scoreboard, the six remaining were bigger than the 21 that he had already cut down. He had faced so many batters over his career. And for even though he had been cut and even though he had been traded and even though he had injury problems, if you're going to sustain a long baseball career, you, you have to understand you faced a lot of batters. But all he could focus on were these six men standing between him and perfection. And all of a sudden, those six men looked immensely large to him. And he was afraid. What if I let one of them on base? What if I blow it? What if I can't be perfect? He became aware of his own limitations. What did he tell his catcher? I don't know if I got anything left. After staring at that scoreboard, he began to oh, begin to shrug his shoulders, and his neck felt kind of stiff, and his, his back hurt a little bit. You saw him flexing a little bit, because all of a sudden he, he realized he has limitations. This is not what he normally does. This is not the way it usually works out for him. And he realizes, I'm not supposed to be doing this. I've never done this before. I'm a pitcher that has to do things a certain way, and, well, this, this just is in my forte. And he begins to become afraid because he realizes he's got limits. He's got restrictions. I mean, he's older. Older pitchers don't usually pitch perfect games. Speaking of that perfect game, I think this is another reason he became afraid. See... He focused on perfection rather than winning. Now just ponder this. At the age Billy Chappell was, and in the movie, he was supposed to be a 41-year-old pitcher. And while that's not very old, I'm telling you, 41 is not old. Okay? But in baseball years, you know, they're kind of like dog years. Okay? And, and, and 41 is old for a pitcher. And if you had told Billy Chappell that in the last game of your career, you're going to be pitching against the New York Yankees, which, by the way, during this time frame, was, they were actually a good team. Not like they were. They were actually a really good team. <laughs> okay, they were actually still winning championships, and people were still cheering for them. So, <laughs> oh, my gosh, I found the spot for Nancy. Okay. <laughs> So, so he, they were actually a, they were a great team. How's that? Okay, they're a good team. They were a great team at that point. And if you had told him you were going to go out and you're going to beat the Ye New York Yankees in a two-hit shutout, you think he would have been happy with that? I bet he would have been ecstatic for that to be his last game. If you would have just told him you're going to win the game, your last game of your career, you're going to win it, he'd have been happy with that. But now as he looked at all those zeros up on the board... Just winning the game wasn't good enough, was it? No. He wanted perfection. And because now perfection became the goal, that means you could not even make one wrong pitch. There wasn't even room for one mistake, and so he became afraid. Because that's a tough standard to live up to. Never going to make a bad pitch. Everything is going to go perfect. Not in my life. How about this one? He forgot baseball was a nine-player game. He was part of a team. Man, as he stood out on that mound, he looked at all those zeros up on the board, and he just felt the weight of the entire team on his shoulder. Oh, my gosh. I can't let him put the bat on the ball because what if? I can't let the ball get up in the air because what if? If I want perfection, then it's all on me, and I just have to take all of it into myself. And he kind of forgot. There were eight other players on that field with him. There were eight other players that were trying so hard to achieve the same perfection that he was. They were in it together. And, and I guess I could fault Billy, because, you know, really, you've been around a while. You should get it. But, you know, Billy isn't really much different than this other guy that we meet in the Bible. His name is Moses. See, Moses had that barrier, that fear of failure. We meet Moses at the, at the burning bush, and you know what? Moses, well, he exhibited the same pattern that Billy exhibited. You see, Moses, when he was there, and God said, um, 
Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. Well, Moses paid more attention to the assignment than what God had brought him through. When God said, Moses, I want you to go and be my deliverer. Moses, I want you to go there. Moses is kind of like, no, God, I'm a wanted man over there. Don't you understand? This is an impossible assignment. Moses has forgotten that Moses should be dead at this point. At the point Moses is sitting at the burning bush, he should be dead not once, not twice, but three times. You see, when Moses was born, there was an edict put out by the king that all the Jewish babies were supposed to be killed. Well, Moses would have been a Jewish baby, so he should have been killed basically at birth. When they found Moses in that little basket floating in the river, well, the Pharaoh's daughter realized he was a Jewish baby. She knew he was Hebrew. She knew what she was supposed to do. She should have turned Moses over to the custody of the, of the Egyptian policemen, and they would have put him to death at the moment he was found. But God delivered him from that one. At the point that Moses killed that Egyptian guy, that guy that he got angry with, and he just lashed out in anger and, and murdered him, by Egyptian law, Moses should have died from that. But once again, God delivered him. But sitting there at the burning bush, and God says, Moses, I got an assignment for you. It's time for you to be committed. Get out of the desert you're sitting in and go back where you're supposed to be. Well, Moses says, God, that's not a good move. I'm afraid. You're sending me to where I might die. You know, um, Moses, he became aware of his own limitations when God asked him to commit, didn't he? Moses had been sitting there, and God said, I want you to go to Egypt. I want you to be my deliverer. He said, well, but God, I, I, don't, I, 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 I don't talk so good. Lord, I'm, I'm slow of speech. Lord, you didn't equip me for this one. What are you talking about? See, that's what happened. God said, I want you to go a little deeper. God said, I want you to make a commitment. And all of a sudden, Moses is aware that I don't have the best skills for this. I don't have the most abilities for this. Lord, you didn't pick the wrong guy. As a matter of fact, I know where your man is. You want Aaron. Aaron's a great speaker. Aaron's good at this. Not me. I'm afraid. The skills I have, they aren't what you need. Moses, well, he focused on Pharaoh's wrath instead of God's deliverance. He was afraid that Pharaoh wouldn't listen to him. He was afraid that the people of Israel wouldn't listen to him. He was afraid that he was going to go down there and say, let my people go. And the people would say, well, we're not your people. And Pharaoh said, they're not going anywhere. And you know what happened? That's what happened. But that became Moses' focus that, you know what? They're not going to listen to me. It's no use in me making this trip, God, because I'm just focused on what is left to do. Not on what you've done for me. He forgot that God was not sending him alone, but going with him. See, when Moses was sitting at that burning bush, he kind of saw that God was handing him a job assignment card. He'd go, Moses... Report to the office tomorrow morning, and I'll see you when you get back, and you can tell me how your day went. But that's not at all what God was doing. As a matter of fact, he gave Moses miraculous signs, not only to prove to the Israelites and to the Pharaoh that, Mo that, that God was with him, but to prove to Moses that God was going to be with him. And the funny thing is, in spite of all this, Moses was afraid to commit. But you know... Jesus understood this too. He understood the way that fear of failure, the way that we put those barriers up in there. He tells a story over in Matthew chapter 25, verses 24 and 25. This is kind of the ending of the story. Then the man who received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered. So I was, there's our word, Afraid, and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. 
And as we look at this man and we listen to this man, he sounds just like Billy Chapel. He sounds just like Moses because you know what? This man, he paid more attention to his master's return than using the gift that was given. That's what he did. He was so concerned that when his master came back, that he wasn't going to live up to the standard. And so he became more concerned with just holding on to it. He was more concerned with when the master comes back, I want to have something to give him. He began to compare himself. He was aware of the master's abilities based on his abilities. Remember, the master could reap where he had not sown. The master could scatter seeds and it all worked out. The master had the golden touch. Everything came up roses for him. And it doesn't work that way for me. So I'm afraid. I don't have the abilities that you're asking me to have. He focused on not losing what he was given instead of making gains. Just like Billy focused on perfection instead of winning, this guy, he sat there and he focused on just maintaining, just hanging on to his one little bag of gold, making sure he doesn't even lose that. He decided to go it alone. He didn't even trust the bank to help him. He decided, you know what? It would be better to take this bag of gold out to a field and dig a hole and bury it and hang on to it until the master came back. I'm not even going to take the time to go to the bank, where at least I would draw a little bit of interest. And in our economy, that would be a very little bit of interest. But still, it's something. It at least showed some initiative and some effort. But he was afraid. <coughs> Do you see it? Do you see the pattern of how fear puts up a barrier for Billy, for Moses, for the guy in the story, for us? Have you ever given God these same excuses when he's asked you to make a commitment? When he's asked you to move out a little bit deeper than what you're doing? When he's asked you to move from just being part of the community to actually maybe coming to church and being part of the crowd? And you've given God the excuse, Lord, I'm afraid of that. When he's asked you to move from being part of the crowd to making a genuine connection and learning who he is, well, well Lord, no, you don't understand. I don't have the ability to do that. I don't learn so well. When he's asked you to make that big jump from where you were just connected, where you just had an understanding of who Jesus was, to pulling the boat up on the shore, that's when it really gets tough. You just, God, I'm afraid of that. Fear controls us so much. And you know what? I'd like to overcome some fear. So this is what we're going to do this morning. We're going to listen to the catcher. Now you have to go back and try to rewind your brain a little bit and remember what the catcher said. But don't worry, I, I've got it all out here for you. We have to remember what the catcher said because standing on that mound, the catcher gave some great advice to Billy that I would like to, well, kind of translate into some advice for us and how to go to a deeper commitment with God. Here's the first thing he said. Live in the moment. Right here, right now. Don't worry about the 21 batters you've already faced, and don't worry about the other ones that you still have to just live in the moment. Right here, right now, we are the best team in baseball, according to the catcher. Because in that moment, guess what? They were. They were perfect. They were great. I think sometimes if we would learn to live in the moment, and by the way, this is something I have to work hard on because I'm not a moment kind of guy. I don't flow. Flowing is not something that usually is in my vocabulary. I'm not extremely flexible. I like things planned and I like to follow the plan. Living in the moment is something I find difficult to do. But I think living in the moment is exactly what God asks us to do sometimes. To go through that barrier of fear and not to be afraid. Just concentrate on what's right in front of you. What is the very next step? Don't look 20 miles down the road. Just look a few inches. What is God asking you to do right now, right at this moment, right at this second? What is God asking you to do? Do that. See, if God calls you to do something, remember, he thinks 
that you're the best option. And I find that kind of odd because there's a lot of things I do. I look around like, God, you could have really found somebody that has more skill at this than me. But the Lord thinks I'm the best option when he calls me to do something. See, best doesn't mean most qualified in God's book. Best doesn't mean that you are the most flamboyant. Best doesn't mean that at all. He just means that you are the best option I could find when God asks you to pull the boat on the shore. That's what he's after. If God calls you to do it, he believes you can do it. You know, God isn't in the business of calling people to failure. Don't believe me? Look through the Old and New Testament. God's not into that. So if God asks you to commit, if God asks you to take the next step, then God believes you can do it. Live in the moment. Here's another one we need to remember. Give it what you got. Okay, Yankee fans, who was Babe Ruth? Go ahead. Who was he? Huh? He was a Yankee. What's he known for? Home runs. Thank you. Matter of fact, I don't care what they say in the record book. You know, they can say all they want, but everybody in their minds, Babe Ruth is always going to be the home run king. Babe Ruth hit the most home runs in the fewest number of games of any other player. By the way, as my dad constantly reminds me, some of those years were as a pitcher, which means that he was only hitting home runs every four days. So Babe Ruth is considered the home run king. But did you know Babe Ruth was also the all-time strikeout champion? As a matter of fact, Babe Ruth struck out almost as twice as much as he hit a home run. So that means every three times that he goes up to bat, you're going to get one home run and two strikeouts. Would you take those odds? Every time, but he's going to strike out all that time. He was asked about this one time in an interview. And his logic was, every pitch I swing at, I swing for the fence. I give it the hardest and most powerful swing that I produce every time I swing the bat. And you know what? If I hit the ball, she's probably going over the fence. If I miss it, then it's going to look really cool on Sports Center later. Okay, they didn't have Sports Center then. But he gave it everything he had every time he got to the plate. And you know what? That's what we need to remember when God calls us to commit. God does not need your ability, He needs your availability. God doesn't need a superstar. He's not building a team of all-stars. You don't believe me? Go look when he picked disciples. He didn't pick the all-stars. He picked the scrubs and the nobodies. I've been watching the NBA championship. And I feel sorry for LeBron James right now. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking, I could go out there and help at the pace they're going. I can hit a three-pointer sometimes. But the reality is, is that God doesn't want superstars. He just wants people that will show up and give everything they've got, every swing that they have, 100%. If God's unconcerned with the possibility of you failing, why should you be? Remember that. If God's unconcerned about it, if God's unconcerned about you striking out at the plate, then why should you worry about it? Just swing at the ball as hard as you can, as consistent as you can. Just swing. Don't be afraid of striking out. Here's another point. You're not alone. You're not called into this. God did not call you to an island. He called you to a commitment. Boy, we forget about that. For some reason, we are much like Billy and Moses when it comes to this. We think that when we commit, that God's calling us to be, go this all alone. I'm going to be all by myself. Me against the world. And you know what? God says that's not the way it's supposed to work. Because you know what? He'll be with you. According to Matthew 28, 20, he says, And teaching them to obey everything, I have come to you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God's not sending you to a commitment. He's walking along with you in a commitment. God's got your back. 
He didn't call you into this just to leave you abandoned. As a matter of fact, not only is he going to be with you, well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 18 and 19, this is what it says. But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. God didn't call you to do all of this by yourself. God didn't call you to play all of the positions. You're not supposed to throw the pitch and then run down behind the plate and catch the ball. And if the batter manages to hit it, you run out to first, you go out to the field in the field and then you run over to first base. That's not how God planned for this to work. There's supposed to be parts to this. You're not in this all by yourself. Church is a team game. Everybody has a position to play, and everybody has a responsibility to do. And when you try to cover other people's positions, you know what you get on the baseball field? They're called errors. And you want those on Sports Center because they look really, really goofy. You know, the person, the ball goes dribbling through, and there's nobody there because the shortstop did the second baseman's job. They don't do that. Everybody stays in position. I told you my, my youngest son went out and played t-ball. I mean, the coach pitched ball for a while. Well, before that, my other son played t-ball. And you know what I call t-ball? It's called kitten ball. Because somebody gets up to the tee and they take that bat and they swing and they hit the ball and the ball goes rolling and there's no such thing as a position. There's only one position on the field and that's where the ball is. And all the little kittens go chasing the one little ball and then they pick it up and guess what? There's nobody standing on first base because everybody was just interested in fielding the ball. I think sometimes we get that mentality as the church. So here's what you're supposed to do. Just throw. That's what the advice the catcher gave to Billy. Just throw. Billy had already faced 21 batters in the game. If each of the batter received a minimum of three pitches, then he had already thrown 63 pitches that day. Summary? Billy knew how to throw a, throw a baseball. He understood the concept that the catcher's going to sit down there and he's going to put the glove up like this and he wants you just to rear back and throw it to the mitt. Billy, just throw the ball. Don't try to do the things that you're not good at. Don't try to take somebody else's responsibility. As a matter of fact, don't worry about first base. Billy, it's not your job. You know what, Billy, if you rear back and you throw the pitch to the best of your ability and you're committed to make it a good pitch and the batter hits it and the first baseman muffed it, it's, well, it's, it's not your issue. You did what you were supposed to do. You just threw the ball. Don't worry about first base. You know what? Don't worry about the balls in the outfield. That's not your job either. You know what, if you throw the best pitch that you can and somebody hits it and it goes flying up in the air, you're supposed to have an outfielder for that. That's his job. We don't want you running out to the outfield trying to catch the ball in the outfield. Just throw the ball, Billy. Just put it over the plate. Just do your job. You know what? Don't even worry about the batter. You know, don't worry about whether he's crowding the plate or he's outside the plate or crouching down. Don't worry about whether he's a power hitter or a left-handed or a switch hitter, whether he likes to pull the ball, whether he likes to put it up the middle. Don't worry about any of his statistics. Just throw the ball. And you know what? If he hits it, you make the best pitch you can, and he hits it, so be it. That's the way it's going to go. The game may not be perfect, but it, you just have to throw the ball. Do you see how this works with our fears? If we would learn to just throw the ball, if we learn to just put the ball in play, if we would stop worrying about the consequences of what we're doing all the time, the next step leading to our ultimate doom, the next step leading to our failure, I think we would have more success in making commitments to God. But when I begin to focus on all the other stuff, I want to stand out there and ring the ball in my hand a little bit, maybe play with my, mat, my mitt my hat, maybe look over the first a little bit, make a few throws over there. I want to do all the things trying to load throwing the ball because I'm afraid 
making that pitch may end perfection. It might. But if you never throw the ball, the game never ends, right? If you never make a pitch, you never can finish. One more thing I want you to remember. You're only being asked to commit your life, not somebody else's. You're not asking to bring somebody else's boat on the shore. God's not asking you to pull your spouse or your kids or your neighbors. He's not asking you to tow in the person across the street. He's saying, will you pull your boat up onto the shore? Will you get into the game? Will you do your part? He's not asking you to do anything else. Because you see, God's plan never fails. Never, ever, ever has God failed. Now, it doesn't always look perfect. It hasn't always been the prettiest thing in the universe. But you know, Luke tells us in chapter 1, verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. God's never going to let you go. If God calls you to pull that boat up on the shore, you are 100% guaranteed you will succeed. Now, understand you'll succeed how God wants you to succeed. It won't be your call necessarily. When God pulls the boat up on the shore, it's His plan that you're submitting to, not yours. That's important to remember. It's kind of funny the way God does things sometimes. Um, when I originally wrote this sermon, I had something I wanted to do for invitation. And I was trying to figure out how to kind of keep it a little bit of a secret and not let it out. I'm like, okay, but I got to give the stuff to Lynn to make the bulletin, and, and then I got to let Monica know what's going on. And then I found out Monica's going to be on vacation for this week, so I don't have to tell anybody what I'm doing. Cool. I could just keep exactly what I'm doing. And then I get the list of songs, and we're one song short. I'm like, hey, good God, see? Just throw the ball, Barry. He'll work out all the details. We're going to do something a little bit different for our invitation time this morning. I'm not going to ask you to stand and sing. I have a video I'd like you to watch. It's kind of an older song, but that's okay. We can learn something from older songs. I want you to ponder the idea, what would happen if you put your hands in God's? If you put your life in God's? If you just let God have control, what could he do with it? If you just threw the ball? During this time, if you need to pray, you could do so right there at your pew. If you need to understand what it means to be a Christian, I'm going to be sitting right up here watching the video right along with you. Just come on up here and we'll put somebody with you. But I just want you to use the next three minutes or so to ponder, what if you were this?